Yeah, you're still watching this day live Sunday talk show here on Arise News Channel with me. This R uh, is in Nemeka Obiareri. He's a certified investment banking executive. We'll also be having uh, Chika today. He's not in the studio yet. They'll, he'll be joining us. But before then, let's take some stories uh, before we we'll bring in Nemeka Obiareri. Uh, Victor Siemens quick fire equalizer spared Nigeria's shock defeat against Equatoria Guinea. In their opening game of the 2023 Africa Cup of Nations AFCON, Osime nodded in a minute after a ban Salvador's opener for the underdogs. Salvador's classy first half finish was a side's only attempt on target and briefly threatened a significant upset in the second game of the tournament. Jesus Owono made several second half saves to deny the Super Eagles, while Osime missed after breaking clear. This result against the Equatorial Guinea makes the game against the host nation Ivory Coast a must win if they want to progress to the next round of the AFCON 2023. All right, now I bring in uh, Nemeka Obiariri, an investment banking uh, expert. Nemeka, glad to have you join us. Let's even start with, Thanks the, for having me. Good, with the sports before we bring in all the things about the NSIPA, the, the Supreme Court judgments and what have you. But Eagles won. Equatorial Guinea, of all the countries in the world, won. And we held them to a draw. What's your take on this score? I mean, the competition is just beginning. I mean, we had um, Italy, was it the 1993, if I remember correctly, when they beat Brazil, uh, towards carrying the cup, they started so badly. Or Argentina that lost to Cameroon, could it be the same here? Or even when we lost to Algeria 5-1 in the first match and still played in the finals with Westerhoff and only lost 1-0 one, one in the finals. What, what, what's your take? I am not surprised um, with the out, outcome of the match and the result. It's, it's, it's just a demonstration of the output of what they put in. And I will tell you why I think so. You know, the preparation was very shambolic. And we've always maintained that we don't have a coach that could put in together this mega stars that we have in the national team. Take for instance, we are supposed to play a Nations Cup in Côte d'Ivoire. Côte d'Ivoire temperature 32 degrees centigrade, Nigeria 31 degrees centigrade. South Africa left South Africa and came to Nigeria to camp. Those in Nigeria left Nigeria to go to Dubai where we have temperature at 21 degrees centigrade. Do you know why they did so? The same thing that we always have in Nigeria, rent seeking, where they will have opportunity of sharing dollar, um, guzzling the more funds made available for the team. And came back, what did you expect to happen? South Africa left South Africa. They didn't go to Dubai, they didn't go to UK. They have the resources. They came to Lagos to camp, to acclimatize. Because Nigerian temperature is the same thing as Cote d'Ivoire. Our administrators chose to go to Dubai. Yeah, you know why they always move to Dubai. So I am not surprised. I, I don't expect this team to go too far. Well, I, I, you know, it's the same thing with, we've always seen in every area of Nigeria. We measure in minus and minus in major. The alarm bell will have ticked when we left the shores of this nation to go to Dubai to prepare for a game that will be played next door neighbor Côte d'Ivoire. So I am not surprised one bit, and I don't expect any miracle from the Super Eagles. That, well, that's a point you have raised, but I would have thought that you would even lay the blame at the uh, doorpost of the coach, who, I mean, quite some number of Nigerians are saying, the man doesn't seem to know what to do, you know, what he's doing. The coach did not hire himself. And every... The coach did not hire himself. Before you hire an employee, you define the KPIs, key performance indicators, and roll it before the person. Once the person is not performing, you give him the boots. This guy from day one, you know, you know, Nigerians jokingly call him the Ojo Elegba Jose Mourinho. And that is what he has turned out to be. You know, and it's, it's very funny. Nigeria is such a country blessed with so much talent. The Afri Reign African Football of the Year, male, is a Nigerian. The Reign African Football of the Year, female, as sad, is a Nigerian. We have stars plying their trade and doing so well globally. 
they will decide to saddle the responsibility of managing global stars to a, a third rated coach in Portugal. I wish us good luck. <laughs> All right, I, I, even, I even listened to the coach. Well, I read, not listened to the coach. I mean, Pesero is saying that he's not under pressure and that his players will perform well. Maybe that statement is neither here nor there. Maybe because he's confident that his boys will play well or because, uh, like you talked about KPI, he doesn't bother. It could be any of the two. But I don't know how you want to look at it when the coach uh, talks about not being under pressure and that his boys will perform when they get into the pitch. And this is the first match. Are, are you not being too forward in trying to, I don't know how to use the word condemn, supposing we eventually get to the final and take the cup? My, uh, Nemeka. My, my brother, I don't know how to... I don't know how to romance mediocrity or to pamper it. A country that have coaches like Emmanuel Amuneke, most of the players today playing at the national team from Victor Simen and the rest of we are raised by Emmanuel Amuneke. We have a coach who have demonstrated competence and capacity. We decided to go to Europe. There are many coaches in Europe, first-class coaches, that would have been very glad to come and work with Nigeria, looking at the talents that we have. And we chose, see, let me tell you, and we know why. Let us not deceive ourselves. We know why. Because most of those top rated coaches will not take one tenth of the rubbish that is offered within the system. Are you there? Okay, good. Let, let's now talk. I'm here. Okay, okay, good. Let's now talk on some other issues. Let's discuss. I mean, you listen to my guest uh, talk on the. Uh, the Supreme Court judgments uh, across the board, eight judgments, eight governors, not decided by the courts, but by the voters' votes themselves. What do you make of your contributions and, of course, of what has happened over the last, I mean, last week? What, what, in, in, a, in a country where there is rule of law, in a country where there is sanity and sanctions and repercussions, majority of the members of the Court of Appeal that presided over the matters of the National Assembly, of the State Assemblies, of the governorship election, should have been sacked by now and prosecuted. Supreme Court have always meant, I'm not a lawyer, but I can read and write. Courts have no business delving into party affairs. Another party has no business delving into the matters of another party. What we saw at the Court of Appeal mostly is what we call judicial rascality and banditry. And no nation can grow with this kind of level of impunity and rascality. Look at Plateau State for now. 16 state lawmakers of the PDP sacked by the Court of Appeal. Now there is a political crisis and constitutional crisis in that state. The YPP speaker of that state have refused to recognize those 16 state assembly members that were Put, that we are given order to have received a certificate from Court of Appeal based on what the Supreme Court adjudicated and their pronouncement on the governorship election result of that state. Now we have a constitutional crisis in our hand. The Court of Appeal is supposed to be the last cause of arbitrage for the case of National Assembly matters and State Assembly. The Supreme Court pronouncement is very clear that those members of the Court of Appeal erred in what they delivered. So what do we do now? The YPP guy said he's not going to recognize them. The Supreme Court will have to intervene. But in a nation, a nation where there is rule of law and where we respect ethics and sanctity, by now, most of those who presided in the Court of Appeal should have been sanctioned and most of them prosecuted because it was a clear case of judicial rascality and banditry. You said correctly, you're not a lawyer. I, I just finished interviewing a lawyer. Uh, who said that what you get in law, I mean, that's why in some, in some instances you hear people say the law, the phrase, the law is an ass. He said that they're human beings, they're not gods, uh, and that's why you have the apex court to make corrections when it is needful. So, I mean, on that case, uh, you're talking about, uh, you know, I don't know whether you talked about sacking them or punishing them. It could just be that that was uh, my my that 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 my, 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 my brother. It go on. It wasn't an error. 
there were many judicial presidents at the Supreme Court to have guided them properly. Like, when I said I'm not a lawyer, it doesn't mean I'm dumb and I can know it all right. There are many judicial presidents out there by the Supreme Court that will have guided them not to make the kind of mistake that they made. These are men who have been in the legal profession for over 10, 20, 15 years. These are not rookies from, from fresh from university. What they did was rascality at the highest level. You need to take out time to read the piece by Professor Chidi Odenkalo to understand what happened and what transpired. And this is not good for our democracy. And this is not good for our country. A country that is already hemorrhaging. One of the things that will restore sanity in this country is for us to carry out massive judicial reforms. What has transpired in 2023 is very, very, very alarming. If we allow this thing to continue, I feel sorry for this country. You talk about reforms. What do you mean? Who will do the reforms? Because again, one would think that the bodies that are responsible for appointing these judges to, the, to head the appeal courts or to... to to, to the appeal courts and what have you, in a way, should also have to be held responsible. I mean, for these erring judges, if indeed they really did err, knowingly, I mean. For me, there are two ways this can be tackled. The National Assembly will have to look at the existing laws in Nigeria and amend them optimally. And the EFCC has to do a lot of work in looking at doing a very serious background check in what has happened over the last one, over the last nine months, to be precise. You know, we need to look back and ask ourselves, how did we get here? And take directive on how we can restructure this land and make it work for every one of us. It is very, very tragic when we have this kind of thing. Look around you. The pronouncement has been here and there. It is so obvious, even to a layman, that what we are having here is very, very damning and dangerous for the peace and prosperity of this country. It is very imperative that there must be massive institutional and judicial and electoral reform in Nigeria. We need it. It's urgently being that we must do it. This country needs massive electoral reform. We need to look at the OIS report and implement it holistically. We need to look at massive judicial reforms. The CGN should not be, in fact, there should be a way. You know, like I've always said it, when I spoke the last time you said about the Central Bank of Nigeria, how it needs to be restructured, not to saddle so much power to one person. Not saddle so much power to the CGN. There, there needs to be a way of unbundling the laws so that even at the Supreme Court level, the judges should be at par. There should, it cannot be a collegiate thing where people must agree on a thing before it is done. No one, one man can sit at one corner and begin to administer and discharge favors and patronages. And this is what brings corruption in any system. Corruption. Call out that one of the guests, uh, my guest, uh, you know, before you came in, uh, were discussing uh, the NSIP suspension for six weeks at the first instance by the President Bola Metinibu so that the uh, panel he set up can holistically look at the program, tinker it, so it can really benefit the people for which it is meant for. That's the vulnerable. He said that corruption directly is directly related to increase in poverty, which we uh, have in the land. Minister of Affairs has been suspended. Uh, she who called in for questioning by the EFCC, Omar Farouk, uh, their predecessor has also been called in. What do you make of all these events playing out? And then, do you think that a suspension for six weeks, the first instance, is necessary? Um, like I said, we are just tackling, we are just um, tackling the symptoms and not looking at the root cause of the problem. Better it is not the problem. Better is, is just what happened with Better is just one of those symptomatic manifestations of a very corrupt and rotten system. In the first instance, the National Social Investment Program shouldn't have been in place in the first instance. Obasanjo did, um, on that back hole, did a National Poverty Education Program. That was very streamlined and excellently executed. 
What we had over the last eight years under Buhari was just a rescue program that was used to empower the very greedy and the wicked in the system. And looking at the structure that we run, what is even the, the duty or the responsibility of the federal government in running a social intervention program? The nearest government to the grassroots is the local government. One of the reasons why we have poverty in Nigeria, and I have said it and I keep on saying it, you cannot eradicate poverty with tokenism on this kind of fact. Over the last eight years, when Buhari took over power, the number of extreme poverty, poor people in Nigeria was 76 million. He left 102 million extreme poor Nigerians and 103 million multidimensional poor Nigerians and 178 million Nigerians who do not earn more than 160,000 naira per month. Poverty today, Nigeria is the poverty capital of the world. And I will give you an example. In 1980, the number of poor people in Nigeria was about 4.1 million. China had 769 poor million poor people. China embarked, they did not embark on tokenism. They decided to embark massive education and microcredit arrangement schemes. In, by 2005, China had moved their literacy level from 62% to 97%. And they were succeeded in removing over 700 million people from poverty. Nigeria has moved from 4.1 million poor people in 1980, 1980 to over 13 million multidimensional people. Do you know why? We have 20 million kids out of school. Poverty, terrorism, banditry, is linked to illiteracy. Illiteracy is not just not being able to read and write. Illiteracy is inability to digest the information and make informed judgments. There are even many who are parading degrees today who are illiterate in the real sense of it and definition. The only way we can move this country forward in sincerity is for us to restructure the constitutional, physical, resource production and control and socio-economic framework of Nigeria back to what we had between 1960 to 1966 when there was productivity at all levels. In fact, at those early stage, the Western Nigeria was ahead in education. Other regions were in doing a lot of intervention program. People were sponsoring their people to go to school to enhance education. We had productivity. We had everybody competing to be productive. Everything was based on merit. There was no race-seeking structure in the political arrangement. Political office holders were part-timers, the members of the legislature. Their pegs of office were tied to that of the civil service. There was no incentive to kill, to steal, to run with election results. Because if you go there, you'll be wasting your time. We had men like Sir Louis or Dmei Gojuku, reputed to be the wealthiest man in Africa then, as a member of parliament. A chairman of 15 corporations, he did not go to parliament to receive 100 million naira um, as, as palliative to share rights to his constituents, or 200 million naira. He went there to, to contribute his intellectual capacity, to, in, to, to contribute in shaping laws that will help build Nigeria. States controlled 50, regions controlled 50% of what they produce. They had their own regional police that were well funded and well equipped. Security was top most. You can enter night bus in Port Harcourt and go to Cannes, nobody will molest you. There was no banditry, no kidnapping, no terrorism, or the kind of madness that we have here in every region in Nigeria. If we want to fix this country, see, if you look at the population of Nigeria, demography, 217 million people, 97.5% of Nigerians, over 211 million Nigerians, are below the retirement age of 64. Only about 5.9 million Nigerians are above 65 years. So, and 70% of Nigerians are youths. So, if we have 211 million Nigerians below the age of retirement, why do we have 133 multi dimensional poor Nigerians? And I can tell you this the average Nigerian is not lazy. With their limbs and hands and legs and eyes and faculty intact, the average Nigerians can be able to be put into productive work to take care of himself and his family. But we need to provide the enabling environment, the enabling security, the enabling physical, the enabling electoral, the enabling merit-driven environment to enable them to prosper. And why do we, how do we do it? Bola Tribi is not going to be president for more than eight years. And interestingly, he had been at the forefront of physical federalism and restructuring of Nigeria. And I want to use this to plead with him. He stands at the threshold of history. He should use the remaining, the remaining days in the office 
whether four years or eight years, to start the process of restructuring Nigeria back to the physical federalism that we had between 1960 to 1960s. And I will tell you this, if we don't do this, even if you bring an NGO to govern Nigeria at whatever level, they will suck him in. We operate a rent-seeking federalism today that can even corrupt an NGO. And the only way we can make this country work is to dismantle the whole institutions, the whole systems, the whole structures that enable criminality, rent-seeking, and consumption, and not production. We'll probably get back to this some more, but let me take you up on what you mentioned in regards to China exiting poverty. Uh, you talked about how they used the tool of education. But here we have 60% uh, reduction from uh, the report I read, we, I read a while ago. 60% uh, reduction of people returning to school due to school fees, increase, transport, you know, and people are falling out of school. In fact, one girl said I could have, we're five, four are going to private schools. I am the only one going to public and I nearly even stayed at home because it's stressing my parents. You know, recently uh, the president, I think he gave out, uh, let me just read this, I'll get back to you. He said, Tidibu approved 683 million billion rather intervention funds. Universities get 1.9 billion. Police get 1.6, while colleges of education get 1.3 billion. This is on the side of schools. How about on the side of parents who are really crying out? With what you have said about education, are we really, I don't know whether to use the word serious. Are we really serious? How do we, because See, it is really tough for parents and students with the cost of living See, and, and everything. We, we, we. We, we are not serious. L let me tell you, uh, cutting 60% of entourage does not cut it for anybody who understands the numbers. Look at the budget, 28.7 trillion. Recurrent expenditure, non-debt, 8.7 trillion. Debt services, 8.2 trillion. Now let me explain to you what is happening here. Deficit financing, 9.9 .9 trillion. Basically, everything we are going to earn from oil and non-oil revenue will be used to service the profligacy, the waste, the corruption of less than 1.1 million civil servants and political office holders in Abuja and across the MDAs in the Federation. Because the recurrent expenditure, both debt and non-debt, is about 16 trillion. Practically all the revenues we are going to earn, including sale of public assets, will be used to take. Look at what the budget of education, less than 2%. I have taken time. Like I said, I devote almost three hours every day looking at the whole structure in Nigeria. I have taken time to read some of the budgets of some of the states and the federal government. The only state in Nigeria that showed seriousness in tackling the issue. And no, we must be very, very careful too. When we talk about education, we seem to pay so much emphasis on the federal government. Basic education is the responsibility of states and local governments. The first nine years of the life of a kid, primary and secondary school education, is the sole responsibility practically of the states and local government. Abia State was the only state that devoted 42% on social investment on education and health. At the federal level that we expected them to show the mark, they gave education 2%. Go and look at that budget. $3 billion for car park for House of Rep. $3 billion for car park for House of Rep. $15 billion for library and $12 billion for library for National Assembly. Which are they going to school? $3 billion for books for National Assembly. Go and look at the frivolities in that budget. We budgeted... 16 trillion naira as debt and non debt recorded expenditure to just take care of 1 million people. See, let me tell you, this country is a country that can easily, on an annual basis, ramp up production of nothing less than $300 billion across the different sectors of Nigeria. From the agri sector alone, I sit down to look at the numbers, look at the sector. This country is a country that is so massively blessed. 
But for this country to work, we must look at the foundational issues. Nobody is being blamed here. Nobody is leaving. You know, even if Bola Tinibo decides today that he wants to cut cost of governance across board by 70%, without fixing the foundational problems, after eight years, somebody may come in again who does not bear in his philosophy and mess up the thing. Peter B in Anambra State saved so much for Anambra State. Did not borrow one cover. Did a lot of physical prudence and physical responsibility programs in Anambra State. Did 800 kilometer roads. Provided security. The state was the most secure state in five years. The man that took over from him went on spending spree. Today, Anambra is one of the most in depth, one of the highly in depth states because the man that took over just decided to go on spending binge, borrowing and whatever. Because the structures were not there constantly to prevent somebody coming to do what he wanted to do. The only way, we do not want to... Look, look at Navdak, Dora Kunyini came, did excellently. After Dora left, the people that have come in there to work at Navdak, nobody knows what they are doing. So the only way we can make this country work is not where we decide to put an arrangement where a good man comes and does well. A terrible man comes and does terribly. We must overhaul the whole constitutional resource production and control, electoral and judicial structure, security of this country, back to what we had between 1960 to 1966. Regions must be able to control their We must devolve power, responsibility, and resources. The regions must be allowed to control their resources and give 20% to the port, to the federal government, and 30% to the port. When you do this, every state and local government who look inward. Look at the gold that is being illegally mined from Oshun to Zamfara. What stop us to, produce, to bring in the same arrangement in oil and gas industry? Bring like a barite gold. Allocate acres of land for them. Provide them with security. Let them mine gold and refine it. And let us do the same shine arrangement that we have in oil. But nobody's thinking about that. There are very many things that we can do to put this... Let me tell you. Nigeria has no business having more than 10 million poor people. We have able-bodied youth who are raring to go to put themselves to active work. We have a very hard-working population. But please, for God's sake, we need to restructure this country. It's imperative and urgent. If we don't restructure this country, let us start with them. All of us are not victims. We are all collectively part of this nonsense. But we must all agree today that we must fix this land. And fixing this land simply means go back to the 1960. 63 constitution, bring it up, overhaul it, and then modify it to suit our contemporary need. Thank God that we have six regions. It can work. All right. Let's talk about uh, the NSIP uh, suspension for six weeks by the, uh, the president. He said he's suspend, suspending it for six weeks, and he has uh, put together a panel led by the coordinating minister of uh, finance uh, the minister of finance and the coordinating minister of the economy uh, Wale do as chairman uh, you know to tinker it and then of course in that we talk about the fact that beta was suspended shehu was sus was sacked you know being questioned by efcc umaru farouk is being questioned by efcc do you think the suspension is necessary what reforms can the president's put president put together the panel put together along with the president to really get to those who are vulnerable i i, I discussed the question of data with color Wale. do we have the data the real data of those people and the, the fact that even the governors want this to go through through their hands but those who are in charge are saying no The, the truth is, suspending or sacking does not change anything. The person that was there, remember in this same country, we had a, an, a, we were told that over 165 billion was spent in 2020 to feed school kids who were at home under COVID lockdown. Nothing happened. Nobody was arrested. Nobody was sacked. Nobody was put. Like I said, the federal government of Nigeria has no business with some of this intervention things they are doing. They are just creating a venue for corruption. Those are the closest to the grassroots and local government. 
We are having this problem because we are operating a quasi-unitary system of government. So much powers and resources are invested at the center. We never had these problems in 1960 to 1966. We can solve this problem. We can kill one bed, uh, three beds with one stone. Restructure Nigeria back to the constitutional, physical, resource production and control framework that worked for us in 1960 and 1963. Let the regions, let the states produce whatever they can produce, contribute, 50%, keep 50% for themselves. Put 30% in the national port and give 10 20% to the federal government. See, look at, for example, in America, they have over 165 ports. States own their port and run it. Even there are private ports. In Nigeria, everything is under the federal government of Nigeria. There should be ports in Ongara, in One, in Cross River State. States should be able to open up and run their own ports without federal government intervention. But the problem we have here is. That everything is concentrated on the center and everybody is going to Abuja. If we devolve responsibilities and resources and powers back to the regions, it was so effective that Ahmad Dubelo, being the leader of MPC, did not even agree to become prime minister. He understood the responsibility to his people. He stood be he stayed behind as premier of Northern Nigeria and sent Ahmad um, Tafa Belowa to become the prime minister because there was nothing at the center for him to go and do. And we must look at that. And that was the arrangement that was agreed to by our four bearers. Ena Horo, Habat Makole, Obafemi Awolo, Nam Dazikwe, Ahmad Dubelo, and the rest of them had many conferences and summits and agreed on a constitutional arrangement, a fiscal arrangement that will take care of the diversified nature of Nigeria. And it worked before the military guy struck. And we know this truth. As long as we continue to operate this 1999. Abdul Salam, Abaka, Kosho, no matter how we amend it, this country will not move forward. Let us tell ourselves the, the basic truth. But even the mending of the constitution, Nemeka, it, it won't be done in one day. I mean, uh, and what you're saying looks like one fits all problem. The moment we amend the constitution, everything works. But in some quarters, it's been talked about that the system is not the problem but the people that handle or run the system. It, it, it is not true. Let me tell you, the average Nigerian is not more corrupt than the average American. It's not more corrupt than the Britisher. What happens that in those areas, the laws and the structures are put in place to act as deterrence. You listen to Obama's wife, Michelle Obama, talking about White House expenses. Sometimes they even... They are careful of what they eat or drink. Because if they eat beyond a certain limit, they will pay. Everything is well structured. You can't go beyond it. Look at what we have today. The insecurity, over the last eight years, we wasted over $29 billion on security expenses. At the end of the day, insecurity festers. Why? The only people that can foster security within their domain are the locals who understand the environment. They know the good, the bad, and the ugly. The current security architecture is not working. And let me tell you, it does not take anything for those in power today to restructure this country. There's no big rocket science about it. We talked about electoral reform. What was the whole essence of IREV? IREV was introduced. But unfortunately, these guys were too smart. They did not include it in the body of law. They allowed INEC to pronounce it as a regulation. The essence of IREV was that elections should be uploaded on time, online, real time. If the law was, if it was put in the law and enshrined black and white, that if results are uploaded on IREV real time and the one at the collection center conflicts with the one on IREV, the one on IREV supersedes, we won't be having most of the rubbish we have today. The laws, if issue of corruption is very simple. In America today, before an American president becomes president, he declares assets and abilities openly and publicly. We know what Obama was worth before he became president. We know what he was, his worth when he left. What stopped us from making it compulsory? And every political office holder appointed or elected must declare his asset and liability publicly in an a portal so that the whole world will see what he owns and what he owes. What stops us from amending the CCB Act and EFCC Act to give them more power? Under the CCB Act, 
put a whistle blowing provision where if any Nigerian helps to blow whistle, to recover what is stolen or looted, or even to, to, to blow a whistle showing this person have looted, 20% of whatever is recovered is given to that person. What stops us from making a law that will make it compulsory for you to register any house or any car or any asset? You must include your BVN, your TIN, and your NIN as one of the precursors. What stops us from making the law that annually every appointed office holder must update, up, upload within that e portal? What it, let me tell you, that if you don't want um, public disclosure, stay away from the public office, stay in your private life. Because even in, in, in the stock exchange, once a company moves from private to public quoted company, everything becomes public disclosure. We know what to do. We know how to do it. But the truth is, I pray that God will touch those who are in place of power authority. To, let me tell you, life is transient. Power is transient. It's ephemeral. Highest you will rule is eight years. Highest you will live here if you live. Life expectancy is 52 years. So if you're 70, you're even lucky. If you're 100, you should thank God. Anybody in Nigeria today who's above 70 should be thinking about how he will reconcile with his maker. And the only way you can reconcile well with your maker is to restructure and rebuild this land to leave it better. I don't than intend to go when I'm 70 in my maker. I'm, I'm, I'm almost getting to getting there, so I don't intend to leave when I'm 70. But thank you so much. I've been discussing with, uh, we hope, just like you said, I mean, that's the key thing. The people who make the decisions, who run the government, is in their hands. That they will be touched to begin to do these reformations that you have pointed out. And, and we believe that things will then begin to work well. And then McCobbery, a certified investment banking executive, thank you so much for being on this day life. You've been watching this day live, the Sunday talk show here on Arise News. I am Ndi Amungu from my entire team here in Abuja and the producers in Lagos and here in Abuja as well. This bye for now and thanks very much for watching.